Blog Talk Radio. Chatting with Nat is a podcast for independent women seeking to speak their truth and to break down barriers. We host honest conversations that help to guide and empower women. Speak your truth and set yourself free. Let your voice be heard. Hi everyone, it's Natalie Jean, it's Natalie Jean, it's Chatting with Nat. And today we have multi-instrumentalist, vocalist, composer, and producer, Ricky Prasad Jr. Ricky Prasad Jr. is a multi-instrumentalist, vocalist, composer, and producer whose music style is alternative pop mixed with reggae, rock, Latin, hip-hop, and R&B. Ricky was selected in 2016 and 2017 to work with the Grammy Foundation at their signature summer program for talented teen musicians. Ricky has worked with legends like Sissy Houston, Savian, Savian Glover, and Christian McBride. Ricky was a member of the Recording Academy's Grammy U program for students studying music in college and former voting member for the Grammy Recording Academy. Currently, Ricky is a voting member of the Hollywood Music and Media Awards Academy. So am I. To date, Ricky has commercially released five albums and two EPs. He has won a Global Music Award, Indie Music Channel Award, and has been named Artist of the Year in Pop Contemporary and Artist of the Year Guitar at the Josie Music Awards 2021. Ricky writes and composes all of his own songs, plays all the instruments, and provides all the vocals. Currently, Ricky is a fourth-year undergraduate student at the prestigious Berklee College of Music in Boston, Massachusetts, where he attends on a full four-year scholarship. Yay! Let's give him a round of applause. Hi, Ricky. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Yeah, my my two little hands can't do you justice. I have to put an applause button on there so that you can feel warm and fuzzy when you're on chatting with Nat. Thank you. I definitely felt that. (laughs) Good. So how have you been during this crazy cray-cray of the, I'm going to say the past six years, but more or less this cray-cray thing that we call a pandemic? Well, I just been trying to keep sane by, uh, you know, keeping up with my studies in regards to attending Berkeley College of Music while simultaneously creating new music to aid in what's going on for myself and, you know, for the people around me. I love that. I love that because um, people that do what I consider that to be social impact methods music, um, I think is very important. And I think that more people during the pandemic we're reaching out for something extremely authentic. You know, when you sit mm-hmm. back, you have to be away from a bunch of people. It makes you really think about about life and everything that's going on in life. And I think that, and, and because before that, we were dealing with all the elections and politics and stuff like that, whether things are true or not true, people are craving authenticity. Mm-hmm. They want, they're craving something that's totally real. And so I think yeah. that a lot of um, a lot of people started to gravitate more towards independent artists during the pandemic because, you know, it's the same old, same old with uh, pop artists. I'm not poo-pooing on the pop artists, but it's the same old, same old. So um, kudos to you for making uh, music uh, geared towards the things that are going on in the world, the, the reality of the world. Um, so one of the questions that I do ask, were you going to say something? No, so yeah, and, and you're doing the same thing as, as well. I commend you for doing that because it really gives me inspiration to uh to keep on what I'm doing because seeing other people do it like you like like how you promote your stuff and how you put so much energy into social your music, it really inspires me a lot. So it's not just a one ended, you know, conversation. Right. So I thank you for doing it too. Oh, thank you. yeah, no, we we both know it's a lot of work. It's driving me insane yeah. that it is so, it's just crazy, the work that you have to put in to, um, into music. Um, but one of the things I love to ask is, you know, obviously during the pandemic, 
um, there are a lot of pros and cons. The cons are people died, people got sick, people lost limbs, all kinds of bad things happened. But there are pros to what happened in the past year and being, I guess, locked up. Um, it takes it, a lot of people took time to self-reflect about who they are, what they want to be. You know, one of the craziest things, and I say this all the time, is the fact that I saw so many families walking with their children, and I'm like, that's just odd to me because you don't you don't see that much in, of that anymore. And there's so many people that are taking the time to like, well, we gotta stay together, so let's walk together. Mm. Um, there are people that I knew that cut back on work because they realized they weren't spending enough time with their families. There are people that quit their jobs like me. Um, and I read two articles about that, that a lot of people were quitting their jobs because what the pandemic did for them is they didn't realize that, you know, one life is short and they want to do something with their life that's more meaningful. It's not just about uh, money. Obviously the animals and mother nature were extremely happy for us not to be outside because the pollution level went down. So climate change. Um, you know, Mother Day was like, and the animal was like, whoa, this is so fantastic. Maybe they'll never come back. Um, so they would have been, they would be happy <laughs> not there in the streets. Um, and for, and as for artists, you know, some artists declared they wanted to do something different with their music. I know somebody that totally rebranded their music, took their music down to put new music up. Um, so did you take time to self reflect about who you are as an artist, how you are? Just or do you want to expand what you're already doing? What did you think about? Well, one thing I really realized during the pandemic is that you know music making isn't like a a one man show because you know before the pandemic it was usually just all me you know creating the songs only putting down the instruments but during the pandemic I really collaborated with my family a whole lot more yeah. you know with us being in the house more often. It was. It gave me more of an opportunity to really sit down with my mother and, and you know, share ideas or, or collaborate right. with my little brother. Because before the pandemic, I was going back and forth from school, and I didn't really have the chance to, you know, talk with my family. I know that that sounds messed up, but it's <laughs> I'm just so busy going back and forth. But um, I realized, you know, music can be such a, a a beautiful thing to bring people together, and I realized that during the pandemic. And I'm glad that we're all musically inclined. We understand each other with our music is because music just is just everything that we do. And that's, you know, the biggest reflection I basically had during the pandemic, in my opinion, with me and my family. Yeah, it's, yeah, no, for me, um, I definitely self-reflected a lot about the type of music that I wanted to bring out. I mean, I thought about it before the pandemic, but it really reinforced dependent really reinforce um, what I need to do with music and make it more effective. It's not that I'm not going to do pop music and stuff like that or lovey-dovey songs. I mean, obviously, if some big person says, well, we want you to do this, Natalie's not going to turn it down because Natalie needs to make money. Um, that's why I like the fact that you and I are on the same page in the sense we're very versatile and that our music can basically just go anywhere. And that that's a plus yeah. when you're able to do that. Um, so how, am, so what was it in the music industry where that just gave you that moment where you were just like, mm, music is me, I've got to do it. Was it something that you heard, you saw, you watched? I mean, what was it that was just like, okay, I, I, I got the music, but I got to, I got to, I have to do it. Uh, you know, there were certain things that happened in my life that I'm like, you know, I'm not going to force, you know, but, you know, I, I had people in the past saying I should do pop, like straight ahead pop. Right. But I told myself, if I'm feeling a certain way towards something that happened in my life, like, for instance, all that was going on with the Black Lives Matter movement with um, right. George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, when I was writing lyrics to what I was feeling about that specific moment, I wasn't going to, like, force it to be pop. I'm just going to let it be what it needs to be. Right. And that's kind of what you were saying before, you know, I'm not going to let you know, people, you know, tell me what to do. I'm going to write how I feel in the moment. And whatever the song turns out to be, that's the song, you know? <laughs> right. Exactly. Oh, I agree with you 100%. Um, you should, anybody that's doing music should do what they feel is right for that particular lyric. You know, whatever yeah. is moving them at that moment. 
Now, how did you get into the music industry? <laughs> so, like, uh, I guess in regards to making records, I, <laughs> I I began making Christmas records for my family and friends. And how that came about was that um, I felt really bad that I wasn't giving my family presents for Christmas because, you know, I wasn't, like, working. Because, you know, I was a kid, you know. Right. And I thought the next best thing was to make Christmas records. And I didn't know anything about, you know, recording or putting together a composition, but I just felt that it was something that I needed to do. Wow. So I took my garage band app on my iPad and I recorded every single instrument through, <laughs> through the means of that all oh, by wow. itself. And uh, yeah, and that's how I got into the music recording business. And uh, I never looked back. Wow. Wow. That's very interesting. You are a genius prodigy. <laughs> genius prodigy. Um, how, is, how important is, is it for you to be authentic in your music and your songwriting? I mean, it means everything to me. I mean, as I said before, I'm not trying to be someone else. I'm trying to be, you know, specifically me, because if I try to be, you know, what other people want me to be, I end up pleasing nobody especially myself what? and that's <laughs> exactly and that's why it's, it's yes and that's why it's so important that you know i stick to my guns and put out who i want to be in the music industry i love that that is so great you know one of the things that you know we have to do as artists is whew, continuously submit our music to so many different things um, yes yes Form. and it can get so annoying <laughs> I'm just going to be honest <laughs> it's annoying, it's a lot of work and we all know that music is subjective but one of the things yeah. that I've got to learn is this so there's a, a paper that I submitted my music to called um, Submit Hub I'll never submit there again but, and I you know music is subjective but the way that they do things there is just weird to me But and but what it did, it made me realize a lot of things. And one of the things that I realized is that people don't understand, especially music reviewers or whoever, the concept of social impact message songs. They just don't get it. Mm. Because mm. every time you send a song to a reviewer or even enter a contest, their whole idea, partly, okay, Part of the, the concept for them to review the song is they want to see if the song is marketable. Is it chart? Mm. chart I don't even know that word. It, will it chart? Is it going to get on billboards? These are the things that they're focused on. Now, the thing that they're not focused on, will this song make a difference in somebody else's life? Is this mm. artist an artist player? Mm. So, so what I've come to realize is that the music industry as a whole doesn't seem to understand that concept that everything's not about money. Everything's not about charting. Sometimes there are artists out here that are trying to make a difference. Because I had somebody come, oh, I love this song, blah, 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 but you didn't riff, you didn't do this. No, because that's not Natalie. That's not who I, that's not who I am. And the thing is, is that what I've noticed, you know, when you go to listen to all these music panels, they'll tell you, oh, if you're going to give us a song and you're writing for Rihanna or whoever, don't give us something that she's already done. Give give us something mm. that she hasn't done. However, when you do that and you become this unique artist, you're like, well, that doesn't sound like this. So what the hell do the people want? Mm. And, and when I made the realization of all of this, I started to think, well, I need to do a proposal to the Recording Academy to ask them to put a social impact message on. Because it's not mm. always about the money. It's not always about these other things. And I think that mm. in reflecting on the music industry as a whole, it's all commercialized. People just don't care anymore. It, 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 a lot of it is ego-driven. And I'm not saying that there are people, artists out there, that are not, that are not about you know the the aspect of helping other people when you but when you look around and you you get all these reviews and you go on these platforms and you're trying to push the hell out, out of your music and they're expecting you to be something else there's something wrong with that do you agree or mm. disagree I do believe that um the industry you know it it changes 
every now and then. Because mm-hmm. I've been taking a history course in, uh, in Berkeley right now. We've been studying that in the 60s. It's all about social activism exactly. and all that kind of stuff. That was the main. But then all of a sudden in the 70s, we kind of went into this es- escapism um, period yeah. to where everything kind of about just, you know, <laughs> partying and all that stuff. So I feel right. like we're in that escapism um, phase right now. But, you know, things change because, it's like you said, you know, a lot of people, the masses are kind of, not really digging this whole party thing anymore. It's, it's they right. they want to hear, especially after the pandemic. So hopefully, hopefully, you know, we'll get back into, you know, having social activism be the forefront of the music industry because it's so important for that for those messages to be heard. Mm-hmm. It is very important, very important. Now, how many instruments do you play? Jeez. <laughs> um, I'm going to assume eight. It's always, you know, increasing over the years, but, you know, guitar, the bass, the keyboard, saxophone, piano, uh, ukulele, harmonica, and vocals. That's a lot. And drums and drums. That's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. Good for you. I can't even play one thing. And I mean, I always tell this story, like I have a smart keyboard that I've had in a box for about five years, and it's supposed to help me learn how to play the piano, keyboard, whatever. And I just procrastinate, and I've been super busy, and I'm like, oh, this year. Now, this year's almost over. (laughs) The the Mm. toy is still in the box, and I have all these books and software, because what you do is you hook up your iPad to it, and it's supposed to teach you. Um, Mm. um, If you ever need with the piano, just, just, just give me a call. <laughs> okay, I will. I will, because Lord and Mercy, I, I, I want to learn how to play something. Now I try to play, learn how to play guitar. I took a couple of lessons, but you know what? I felt like a contortionist, and I was just like, oh my God, I do not feel comfortable. But later to learn, I mean, the other day, somebody would say, you know they make guitars for women. I was like, oh, well, maybe that was the issue, and I, uh, why I felt so much like a contortionist. It was just super crazy. Um, mm. now tell me, how did you, how did you get involved in the Grammy U program? I believe it was my mother who, um, brought that to my attention. I believe she, uh, in contact with somebody, I'm not exactly sure of, on the specifics, but she mm-hmm. gave me that information. Like, okay, yeah, this is a very good, um, organization to be a part of. And once I got a part of it, it was just a really cool experience all around. Um, I got to meet Ella May. She's like doing like a a sound check, and they invited the Grammy U people in the New York chapter to go visit, and it, it was just really cool. And she was a, uh, you know, really down to earth and inspiring. And this is one of the the few things that Grammy U does for its members. That's awesome, awesome, awesome. Yeah. I'm going now. I'm going to play your song Paradise. That is about. So Paradise was kind of like me looking into. It's basically my musical journey. It's basically that I'm talking about me leaving to this, to, to like this island, but like that's kind of like a metaphor for kind of like, you know, making it big and all that kind of stuff. Right. And that's basically what the song is about. It's just like kind of a whole metaphor about my, um, my journey and where I'm going to go to in the future, and which I call paradise. Awesome. Well, let's play it.
a way that you fuse several genres in that song. I like it. I like it. You're just like you like to do your own thing. Um, and and think that's the question. How do you, you know? Do you like to follow the rules all the time? Because I don't. You know, if somebody asks me to do something, they have it. They want it a specific way. Obviously, I'll do it that way. But sometimes I'll sit and I'll write a song and I try to do like verse, verse, chorus, verse, verse, bridge, whatever. And I'm just like, why am I doing that? That's not what I'm feeling at this moment. I want to do what I want to do. So how do you go about your songwriting process? I kind of use the, the Freddie Mercury method in that mm. I would write like little passages that are intended for different songs. But then I'm like, oh man, I can't, I can't figure out how to finish this one piece or this two piece together. So this mm. song is like the combination of several pieces kind of stitched together. And the reason mm. I call that the Freddie Mercury method, because that's exactly what he did on Bohemian Rhapsody. Because when I heard him talking about that in interview, I was like, wow, that's a great idea. So I utilize that method for for this song, and that's what you're hearing. That's why it goes from, like, funk to, like, Latin, and then there's, like, a percussion breakdown. Yeah, that's that's how I came about writing for that specific song. I love it. Um, and I love Freddie Mercury. I One year when I went away, I um, read uh, his biography. That's when they had released uh, the movie, and I was just, in fact, I saw the movie on the plane and I was bawling. I was mm. like, oh my gosh, I just one person I wish I had was able to meet because I think um, his music is incredible. I think he was incredible, um, just a phenomenal person. And, and I do try to follow him in the sense that, you know, he mi- mixed classical with rock and did a bunch of stuff, you know, that <laughs> weren't expecting. And one thing is like he one of the songs is over six minutes and he says, I don't care. This is what I want to do. And it's interesting to me that, you know, people that paint or draw and stuff, like people don't tell them, look, well, you missed a splash of orange or yellow here. And you didn't, I see a little stencil thing that wasn't right, but in music, people are so critical. Um, and they want you to do everything that they want rather than saying, you know what? You're an artist. I love that you, you, you create your own artistry. You mesh whatever genre that you want to mesh, and you're trying to create something new and exciting. Um, because I think music needs to evolve. I mean, if it were up to radio stations, we would be listening to the same artists for the rest of our lives, which is so disgusting. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. when Lizzo came out with her famous song, whatever that was, I mean, they were playing Morning, Noon, and Night. To the point that I can't listen to Lizzo anymore. In the beginning, when we release music, I know it has to uh, play and you have to pr- push the song better than that. But after a while, come on. <laughs> There's like mm. nothing already. I don't want to hear that anymore. And I think a lot of people are tired of the same people all all the time. You know, back in mm. the day, 60s, 50s, whatever, you could just bring your little 45 record and say, here, can you play it, please? Nine times out of ten, they play it. It's not all this payola now. It's not all this, I mean, the stuff that we have to do with the music industry right now is way more work than they did back in the day. Um, mm, yes. It's, it's, it's just crazy, the things that we have to do. Now, who would you want to perform with? Dead or alive? Name three people. Prince, most definitely. Okay. Jimi Hendrix, and I guess one that's living. Oh man, <laughs> Paul McCartney definitely, because McCartney and Dave Grohl, because mm. those guys are so positive, and they, you know, their music has been such an influence to my own that right. it would be like a dream to perform with those two guys one day. Oh, I get that. I get that. I get that. You know, where is the craziest place that you've ever written a song where an idea just popped into your head and you, you're just like, oh, I have to write this down? Mm. The craziest place that I've ever wrote in a song. And most interesting. <laughs> I guess, I guess I've been writing a lot of songs in the train recently, mm. and that's a little bit crazy. Because you got the loudspeaker announcer guy right? constantly making messages. You got your person sleeping on your shoulder. And I'm like, please get off. 
<laughs> yeah. And <laughs> yeah, like the train has been some some really interesting songs have been coming from um, me riding on the train because if you haven't known this whole semester I've been going back and forth from my hometown to to Boston where I go to school in Berkeley. Right. And I've been going to the train a lot. I need to kill the time with something. And that's why I've been writing a lot. And um, this next project going to be coming out with, it's going to, you're going to hear all that crazy stuff. With, with I, like to, it. To, I love it. I love it. Um, I always tell people the most interesting place, and it's a place where everybody comes up with music is in the shower. <laughs> I can come up with the best stuff in the shower. Now, Will I remember anything once I get out? No. Even if I try to, I mean, I'll try to repeat, repeat. By the time I get to the phone, I'm like, oh, my God, I can't remember anything. So then somebody told me it's probably because in the shower, you know, you're by yourself or not by yourself. Um, the water is soothing. Um, you just feel free. There's no constraints, obviously, in the shower. So yeah. I'm trying. I need to contact somebody at MIT. Somebody over in North Carolina. I've talked about this idea. So I want to create like a waterproof um, that will remove the sound distortion, but can, they can hear your vocals or whatever you're trying to repeat while you're in the shower. Press that's a great button. idea. That's, that's a and great then, idea. I would use it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I was telling this other person about this, and she, it's just like, you know, Natalie, you, there's things called um, – Shower pads. I'm like, what? What? <laughs> it's like waterproof pads that you can put on the shower wall with a pencil and it doesn't get wet. Wow. So I, you know what? While I was oh. on the podcast with her, I, I purchased one. I have to put it in the shower. I haven't seen it, so it will work yet. OMG. I am so using that, but I still have to come up with my thing. But I was like, what? Mm. I've never heard of that. I'm like, all right. Okay. Well, I'm going to start writing in the shower. That's what I have to do. Um, so we're going to yeah. play. We're going to play. What's the other song? Is it Train Never Stops? Tell me what that's about. It's basically about, you know, haters. Because, uh, you know, in your in every, every artist's life, you will get someone who's like, hey, man, I don't like this. I'm not really digging this. And, and this song is just my mm -hmm. response to everybody who's against me. And I'm just saying, I don't need to hear your opinion no more. I know who I am. And you're just not worth my time. And I'm just talking about people who just give you, like, hate, hateful messages. Because there's a difference between hate messages and constructive criticism. Right. And I've right. learned in many years to, you know, to, to, to differentiate the two. And this is specifically for the people who hate on me. And that's all that's about. All right, let's play
you know, Ricky Prasad Jr. aside from the artist. And I feel like it's very important for people to see the other side of an artist aside from just this machine that's putting on all this music. Yeah, no, and what I read also is that the, not read, I I did a TikTok uh, um, webinar and they were saying how um, authentic videos are the highest uh, viewed videos. Like those are the, the videos that people like to gravitate to because, you know, people can relate to those particular um, videos. They can say, oh, I can do that too. And so they said those are yeah. the higher numbers. But no, I'm trying, listen, <laughs> I'm trying to catch up. Mm-hmm. I'll never catch up to the videos that you do. And every now and then something will pop into my head to say, okay, Natalie, you need to do this video. I've been dying to do a video on menopause, hot flashes, which I finally did. And then I also, I often use my cats in my videos. And then I have some videos uh, with my music and, and I have a lot of bunch of ideas. Um, you know, it, it's what's interesting to me in this business, you just need that one, one big break. That one big break. Yeah. That's all you need. That one big break where somebody sees you and says, you know what? I've got to make this person a star. I want to help this person achieve their dream. And I continuously to tell people you just you have to keep fighting. You just have to keep fighting. Um, but it's a lot of work. And one of the things I talked with your mother about when I had her on my show is the fact that I think that people that are studying music in school really need to understand uh, the whole dynamics of the business end of uh, music. Because when you start out in this music business, people are going to come at you left and right. Oh, I can do this for you. Oh, do you want distribution? Do you want to be on a label? Do you want to do this? Here's an agreement um, that, you know, that you need to understand maybe even better than the person that's presenting you the agreement. Do you agree? Yeah. Yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. More about, especially in schools. Cause uh, it's literally a, a make it or break it kind of aspect. If you don't like the business is so important. Like if you don't incorporate that into your artistry or in other words, if you mm-hmm. can't also be an entrepreneur on top of being an artist, you cannot make it in this industry right now. Exactly, exactly. Um, what are three things you wish you had known about the music industry before you got into the music industry? I wish I would have known more about copyright because going okay. into it, I didn't know that there was like a C copyright and a P copyright. In other words, there's the, re- the copyright for the recording and the copyright for the, the actual composition. And, you know, when you write, co-write with somebody, you got really got to get these things nailed down. Otherwise, it's going to be a lot of, you know, a lot of bad blood going on. Right. Yeah. Number two. I would say social media because uh, Mm. it's very important to have a professional social media. I mean, I always had, I wasn't ever putting, like, inappropriate stuff on my social media to begin with. But from the beginning, I guess I should have been more, you know, pro- well, I was like, like I said, I was always professional with it. I just, I just, I didn't see the, the importance of social media until a little bit later in my career. And I really saw, Hey, this is, this is the platform for which right. people can actually make like YouTube and TikTok. Cause when I was a kid, I didn't think about that stuff. I was just playing just for fun. But then when I saw like Justin Bieber or more recently, Bella Porch, Lil Nas X, like this is, this is it. Right. And also the business side of things. Again, when I started, I didn't really think much about the business side of music, but it's a very intrusive business. And yeah. you really got to learn. Like, that's one of the biggest reasons why I went to college mm. because I just really, really wanted to know the business. I wanted to know the terms. I wanted to know the people. And yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you on all three fronts. Uh, what are What are your plans after graduation? Well, I plan to really broaden my artistry with taking dance lessons, taking mm. acting lessons, improv lessons, just to make my overall musicianship and his overall me as a person just broadening it even further into what it is right now. That's awesome. Keep it going. Keep it going. 
Um, and on the music front, uh, any more new? I know you just released uh, the Enlightenment, um, but are you releasing any more music? Um, it's something that correlates with my uh, my graduation. I I don't want to give out all the information yet, okay. but it's that's what's coming down the pipeline. Also, my um, another artist that's associated with our label, Mystique Sun Records. He's also coming out with some really cool tracks. So there's going to be a lot of stuff coming out of my camp in the next couple of months. Yeah, that's one and one and a half of a busy family. My gosh. The Rickies. <laughs> the Rickies. And you all have the same name, except for Valerie. Valerie's like, oh, this is yeah. easy. Let me just name them all the same thing. Uh, yeah, your mom is, <laughs> is, is exceptional. She's cool. She's She's like a woman that does it all. I mean, I enjoyed watching her the other day as well as in watching you at the Rockwood Music Hall. Um, oh my God, she's like call her Superwoman. There's, no, I mean, there's nothing she can't do. Nothing she can't do. I know, right? She's she's exceptional. All right. So last thing, what is a uh, a quote or message or um affirmation or whatever that you like to use to push yourself on a daily basis on the hour or during the year the month if you have one for myself or for the people just in general for yourself this train never stops <laughs> train never just stops keep on going. and no matter what happens i'm going to still do music whether it's through producing songwriting performing i'm still going to do it because it's something that i love and it's something that I see myself doing for the rest of my life. This train never stops. <laughs> Amen. No, it doesn't. All right, Ricky. It's been wonderful to have you on what I would call chatting with Nad. Um, it's because you are a force to be reckoned with. And, I'm, and I can't wait to hear when you say, oh, my God, I'm signed with X, Y, and Z, whoever that label is. And you're playing at Madison Square Garden or you're playing at Carnegie. No, you're going to play at Carnegie next year sometime, but having your own darn show. Um, it's truly yeah. been an honor for me to have you on my show because uh, you're just awesome. Yes, thank you for having me. And, and it was such a pleasure talking with you. Honestly, thank you so much. Now, we can find Ricky Persaud. So, Ricky has all these links here. Ricky, Ricky Persaud, JuniorFYC.com, because it's Grammy season. And there's Ricky Persaud, Jr. Yes. Dot com. Then there's Twitter. Then he's on Instagram. He's on Facebook. And definitely go find him on TikTok. You'll find a thousand videos on there. I don't know if there's a thousand, but there's a lot of videos on there of Ricky doing his thing. Um, yes. So yes, again, it is Grammy season, and we do have. He has his uh, album, The Enlightenment, in the alternative category. Um, so anybody yeah. out there listening, um, if you're a voting member and you're voting an alternative, check out his music. This is awesome. Thanks again, Ricky, for being on Chatting with Nat. I really appreciate it. Yes, thank you so much, and have a, a blessed day. Thank you. All right, everyone, this is Chatting with Nat with multi-instrumentalist, vocalist, composer, producer, Ricky Prasad Jr. Until next time. Oh. Chatting with Nat is a podcast for independent women seeking to speak their truth and to break down barriers. We host honest conversations that help to guide and empower women. Speak your truth and set yourself free. Let your voice be heard. Love your love.